one, and you are live. Good evening, everyone, and, and welcome to, uh, to PNP Live. Uh, I'm Brad Graham, the co-owner of Politics and Prose, along with my wife, Lisa Muscatine. You know, in response to the COVID-19 crisis, uh, we've been able to move many of our author talks uh, online. Uh, and we're very grateful that so many of you have been able to move with us. Uh, there's no ticket price for these events, uh, but they do take uh, quite a lot of work behind the scenes to, to organize. So um, we'd welcome whatever contribution that you'd like to make to support the series. Uh, now, when you signed on uh, for, the, for this evening, uh, you were asked if you wanted to, to contribute and we, we thank you if you did. Um, and uh, if you haven't um, uh, made a contribution, but you'd like to, there is a, a, a donate button uh, on the screen, on the bottom of your screen here. Uh, so, so don't be shy about using it. And also, if you haven't already, uh, please purchase this evening's featured book by simply uh, clicking uh, on the green button that's also uh, down, down below. Uh, with our stores closed to, to customer foot traffic, these online purchases really do help to keep us going and to continue bringing this virtual programming to you. Uh, with Crowdcast, which is the uh, platform that we're using this evening, uh, you can see us, uh, but we can't see you, so, so relax. Um, and you can still ask a question. To do so, uh, just click on the uh, Ask a Question button um, at the bottom. Uh, and there you'll also be able to read the questions that, uh, that others uh, have asked and even to vote for the ones you like most uh, uh, to hear answered. And we'll get to uh, as many questions as we can later in the, in the program. Uh, now I'm going to bring David Sachs into the conversation. Uh, David's a, a freelance journalist and writer who's reported for a number of publications and written several previous books of, about business and, and culture. His first work, uh, Save the Deli, was an impassioned cultural history uh, about the decline of the Jewish delicatessen. His second, The Tastemakers, uh, was a, a wider exploration of food trends. Uh, and his third, The Revenge of Analog, uh, chronicled how, uh, even in an increasingly digital world, uh, some decidedly untechy businesses uh, have managed to make a comeback, uh, among them independent bookstores. Uh, in the soul of an entrepreneur, uh, David takes on the subject of uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, not so much how to be an entrepreneur, uh, but what it means, uh, what it means to be one uh, and why people have chosen to take, an on, to take on that role. Uh, it's a very instructive uh, and thoughtful book uh, filled with fascinating and insightful profiles of entrepreneurs in a, in a range of businesses. Uh, and, and for David, there was a, a very personal aspect to his research. Uh, as he notes several times in the book, uh, because as someone who is a freelancer, self-employed, and, and, and very much his own boss, uh, David closely identifies with the label entrepreneur. Um, is, isn't that right, David? That is true. Yeah, I am wearing the same sweatpants now as I normally do when I'm writing the book, so this is not much of a different life for me. I mean, you, you recall somewhere in the book that the last regular paycheck you received was in in 1999, when you when you worked as a copy boy, so so what's it been like not having a regular paycheck for, for more than two decades? It's it's funny. It's um, you know I have friends who have jobs, a lot of friends who have jobs, most of my friends, and the question I constantly get from them is, what do you do? What do you do all day? And I'm like, well, you know, I, I research things and I write and then I go speaking, and they're like, yeah, but but what does your day look like? Like when you wake up and you drop your kids to school, what, what happens after? It's like, well, I go home and, you know, I get to open up my computer and it's like, do you shave? No, God, no. Do you shower? Well, you know, if I'm meeting someone, but like, how does it work? Do you get, like, there's this sort of mystique to it. And I think, I think that that is the, the inherent, the inherent kind of risk that every entrepreneur has to undertake, right? Uh, in order to get the freedom of being an entrepreneur. And that is, you know, you have to accept that risk of the uncertainty, the uncertainty of what work you're going to get, the uncertainty of when and where and how much you're going to get paid. You know, every year my accountant or my financial advisor is like, so what are you going to make this year? You know, we're just calculating your, I don't know, benefits or whatever. And I'm like, I don't know. Ask me at the end of the year. Ask me like six months after the end of the year when I actually take the time to look at it and someone actually pays me. You know, I don't know. I have no idea. Um, so it's funny that that uncertainty is just something I'm used to. 
and that's my norm. But for most people, it's this unfathomable existence. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, a major premise of the book is that there's a, a lot of misunderstanding, a lot of mythology uh, actually surrounding the, the word entrepreneur. It's often associated with, with invention uh, and innovation of, of new technologies and, and industries. Uh, it evokes images of, uh, of a lone genius, you know, an exceptional visionary uh, individual with names like, like Jobs and Bezos and, 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 uh, and, and, and Zuckerberg. Um, but, but your point is that entrepreneurship is, is much more than this rather narrow, rather elitist portrayal. Um, you you want to elaborate on that? Sure. And I think it, you know, it, it pays to go back to what the definition of entrepreneur is and where it came from. So, you know, this is a French word, entrepreneur. There's my years of French elementary school going to work. Um, and it meant various things, a battlefield commander, the leader of an orchestra, an undertaker, basically, someone who undertakes something. That was the, the broad definition. And it enters into the, um, the vocabulary of business and economics uh, in around 1730, where this French Irish economist living in Paris named Richard Cantillon writes a book of essays about sort of how the economy works. And the book of essays is published actually 20 years later, long after he's dead. And one of the chapters is on the entrepreneur. And he basically says, there are two types of workers in any economy, the person who has regular fixed wages and the person who has unfixed wages that aren't regular. And the unfixed wage person is the entrepreneur, whether they are the landowner and the wealthy merchant or the sort of beggar in the street and the, the peasant farmer who takes his wares to market. And the thing that unites them all is that they accept the risk or they bear the risk of that uncertainty in the hope of some greater pay tomorrow. The farmer hopes that the bumper crop of wheat that they're going to get next season is finally going to make them sort of get out of the hole. The, the wealthy merchant sends his ships off to the new world in the hopes of some greater fortune, but takes that risk in case those ships sink or you know, there's no golden spices at the end of the Atlantic. Um, and that really is the base definition of the entrepreneur, which captures anyone who works for themselves. Someone like me, who is an independent freelancer with no corporation, no employees, has always been on my own, but, you know, doesn't have a business that he's building or anything like that. Or someone who starts a business and she might begin a company that's a small company or a medium company, a retail store, a manufacturing company, a software company that could grow to hundreds or thousands of employees and get listed on the stock market. Um, so how what, did the notion of entrepreneurs as sort of bold dreamers and inventors come to kind of dominate the, the public yeah. notion of, uh, of an entrepreneur? I mean, it really is, is you know, a 20th century story that's, that accelerated over the past couple of decades, right? In the 1950, it, sort of like 1949, I think there's this um, Austrian economist, uh, Joseph Schumpeter, uh, who is teaching at Harvard, publishes this book. And in it, he has a chapter on entrepreneurs like Cantillon. And he says that the entrepreneur is the key engine of change in capitalism. And his job is the creative destruction, right? The, the, the disruption of the existing to sort of come up with the new. Um, and, you know, he invents a new process or he invents a new product. And that completely changes everything and, and, and shifts the paradigm. And that idea started to gain traction in the 70s in the sort of circles of conservative thought, you know, uh, Milton Friedman, Chicago School, but really takes hold in the 1980s with the rise of Silicon Valley, because suddenly you have these individuals, people like Nolan Bushnell at Atari, Steve Jobs, um, Bill Gates, Bezos, Larry Ellison, yada, 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 on and on and on, um, who are, you can point to and you're like, look what that individual did. And there is that disruption. And everybody said, well, this is what a real entrepreneur is. It's not some schmo who has a dry cleaning business or some fool who bought a bookstore. It's, it's these wild inventors. These people are geniuses. It's, it's the modern day Thomas Edison's. Um, they're the ones who propel us forward. And so what you saw over the past 15, 20 years, as the rise of the internet and smartphones and, and other digital technologies propelled this new class of entrepreneurs into stratospheres of astronomical wealth. Um, you had 
a cultural shift where entrepreneurship suddenly became this incredibly desirable and romanticized thing. You know, the I'm sure if you go in the business section, the best sellers are, are biographies of Steve Jobs, still that Walter Isaacson book or Ashley Vance's book about Elon Musk. Um, and there's a new one about Instagram out this week and various other ones. There, you know, these, if you look at any reality show on TV, whether it's Duck Dynasty or Cake Boss or Matchmaker in Heaven or whatever the hell it's called, they're all about these entrepreneurs, these successful business people who've done that. You know, Shark Tank is, I don't know, 20 seasons on TV. It, it, it's become very glorified, but only one aspect of it has. And that is the sort of disruptive winner takes all aspect of entrepreneurship that excludes the vast majority of entrepreneurs who don't fit into that. Right. So um, what, your book, what, your, what your book does, of course, is then take us on a journey uh, to meet a, a number of other entrepreneurs who are anything but this kind of mythic um, type uh, that um, is so often associated with si si Silicon Valley. I mean, you, you write about an immigrant family from Syria that risks, risks everything to, to build a bakery, a, a black woman in New Orleans who, who from a single beauty salon developed an array of hair products now sold in salons and, and beauty supply stores across the country and a rancher in California whose business after 13 years has has, has stopped growing and, and who's now struggling. So, so how did you find these individuals and, and why single them out? Yeah, that was, I think, the hardest part of, of writing this book um, because, you know, unlike my other books, let's say the Jewish deli book, right? There's only two, 300 Jewish delis around the world. So I just figured out where I could go and which ones I could talk to and whoever answered the phone was great. Um, or with the analog book, you know, there's only so many companies that are making film these days. Um, so it was easy to find one or two of them. You know, the, the scope of, of talking about entrepreneurs was limitless. What I wanted to do was tell the stories of the different reasons and different types of entrepreneurs and the reason why people become and are entrepreneurs. And so I almost identified the different archetypes of what those are, the lifestyle business, um, the ability to, you know, doing it because you have to start over, doing it because it's a way of expressing your values, doing it because it fits in with your concept of community and it's your way of sort of relating to your community. Um, or, or even the question of, you know, how do you deal with failure? How do you deal with hardship? And then trying to figure out, okay, what would make sense for that? So for, for Seth, the rancher who's in, um, in California, I, I wanted to, to find, okay, what is a profession that has a tremendous number of entrepreneurs where most of the people working in it are actually self-employed and they bear the highest personal risk. And I thought of farmers, I've written about farmers before when I wrote about food. Um, and it just made sense and I that farming is going through a crisis. And, and I started reaching out to farm aid organizations and found one that was sort of two hours outside of Silicon Valley. And so it made sense for when I was going to be going to interview, you know, the startup kids at Stanford. Um, and you know, there was a lot of that. And some of those chapters took, you know, pre-interviews and phone calls with 10 people before I found the one person that fit exactly what made sense to me. And then other ones were very happenstance. Um, you know, the Syrians, in Toronto that I wrote about, you know, I saw an advertisement for a Syrian restaurant opening up five blocks from my house um, a couple summers ago and wrote about it and knew that I was working on this book. So it sort of kept it in mind. Yeah. I mean, one common theme through, through all these stories is that being an entrepreneur is often much more uh, than, than just uh, about making money, uh, right? The profit motive isn't, isn't the main thing that, that drives these people. I, I agree. I mean, I, I even beyond this book, you know, I've interviewed lots of entrepreneurs over the years, and that's why I wrote it because I've always been interested in them. I've rarely met one that said to me, you know, well, the reason I'm doing this is I'm going to make a ton of money. I'm going to get so rich. I mean, obviously, that's why you went into the book biz, you know, the bookstore business. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, the sure. for young men like you, um, uh, but you know, every entrepreneur, even those who are working in finance that I've met and are starting hedge funds, they're interested in it because it's a problem that they want to solve. It's something that they want to do. They have an itch that they want to scratch and they can't do it in the confines of where they're doing it. Every entrepreneur is driven by something. And if it's money, 
then that passion or that interest or that that reason for doing it is going to dry up as soon as the money dries up. And at some point in every entrepreneur's life, the money dries up, even if it's for a quarter or a month or, you know, over a recession or a whatever the hell we're going through now. Right. So yeah. what is that thing that's actually going to to bring you through it? And and I find for every entrepreneur, it's different. And that's really how I organized the book or the chapters was by those motivations. Why are you doing this? Right. Yes, you want everybody wants to make money, whether they want to make stratospheric amounts or whether they want to just be comfortable depends on who they are in their circumstance. Nobody wants to lose money. Nobody wants to fail at being an entrepreneur. But beyond that, what are the things that drive you? And and this is where I, you know, I warned you that I wanted to ask you questions, but okay, you were a journalist like me, you wrote books like me. So clearly rolling in money already, yeah, just <laughs> gold cars. Um, uh, and uh, nine years ago, you and your wife purchased this venerable bookstore in Washington, D.C. and became entrepreneurs. Why did you do it? Well, had we actually known anything about business, Maybe we, we wouldn't have. I mean, you know, I was looking back, um, look, looking back, um, you know, it, we, it turned out that we timed it just right. But uh, uh, at the time, you know, it was, uh, that was uh, the, the book business was a terrible business. Um, uh, but then the newspaper business was also looked to many people would be like a failing business. A worse business. <laughs> yeah, or yeah, worse. So it was like out of the frying pan into the fire, you know, what more did we have to have to lose? But um, no, I mean, you know, there was, we felt a certain affinity, you know, having been journalists and um, my wife and I, and she been, was a speechwriter. So we were already in the sort of world of words and ideas. And it didn't seem in that sense, like that much of a leap into book selling, although it, it was in another sense, actually a gigantic leap because it meant that we you know, then had to sort of run a business and neither of us had ever done that done that before. Um, I'd had it. I had an MBA. Uh, it's gotten very dusty because I'd earned it back, back in the 70s and never really used it. Um, and so, but I, you know, recalled a few basic things from 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 back there, uh, like how to you know read a balance sheet and an income statement. And, and that's come come in handy. But, you know, I don't know, we just, um, you know, bookstores have a mission, just like, you uh, uh, journalism has a mission, and uh, it just it just seemed like uh, might be a good fit. Although you know we spent lots of months thinking about it before we uh, we did it, and and the previous owners took a long time to deciding on whether you know we were we were we were the right people. Um, so as it you know it's it's turned out to be a great adventure. Uh, we we ended up timing it right. Um, more by luck than anything else, because you know, just after we assumed ownership of PMP, the independent bookstore business, generally in this country, for for, for many bookstores, uh, started improving. Uh, although I have to say, in recent weeks, given the crisis we're in, um, you know, I, I have thought about what it would have been like had we decided to, you know, go the route of retirement instead instead you should have you you lit, lit a match on like march 15th as you walked out the door yeah, that's right the insurance up to date yeah no i think we'll we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll get out of this and yeah. um, you know and i think bookstores uh, continue to play even though uh, most all of us have had to close our doors uh, we continue to i think try to connect with the public uh, through web orders and answering phones and you know, trying to provide books in this in this very difficult time for um, for for people. Um, you know, I wanted to come back to this idea though of of, um, of being driven by profit or not. I mean, you mentioned Milton Friedman uh, a, a little while ago, and and as 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 you well know, there's a prominent school of thought, famously articulated by Friedman back in in, in 1970, that the sole responsibility of a company. Uh, is to serve its uh, sh shareholders by increasing profits. Um, but, but many entrepreneurs, um, you know, believe in social responsibility or, or other missions. So is that is that just wrong or misguided or risky or? 
I mean, I think the 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 idea of which which is wrong. Not, 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 idea or? not just being solely focused on on making a profit, but having you know these other uh, other goals and missions in mind. I mean, I think again, you know, the two things that every entrepreneur is guaranteed is that freedom and the risk that comes with it. Right? You're never guaranteed profits. You're never guaranteed revenues. You're never guaranteed growth. You could pursue them as your sole focus and goal all you want, but at the end of the day, are you measured by that entirely, right? Um, you're not some you know, fly-in, parachute-in CEO whose job it is to increase uh, the stock price over X number of quarters or you don't get the you know, third tier bonus of a couple hundred million dollars you're supposed to get. This is a thing that you build from the ground up often or take over and 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 carry the legacy with as, as you've done, Lisa. Um, uh, and so can you measure what you do in terms of profits entirely? I don't think so. Um, I think Friedman's notion though is a troublesome one for entrepreneurs because it's often been baked into, especially now the, the startup myth. Um, and that is driven by sort of the model of venture capital funded entrepreneurship, which says, look, the only thing that matters is rapid growth, complete dominance of a market, you know, achieve a monopoly and then maximize profits for your shareholders, us, your venture capital investors and our beloved Saudi backers um, uh, as, as much as possible. And what that does is listen, that's, that is a that's a thesis that's an economic model that makes sense for certain people but it shifts the nature of what you're able to do with something it 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 takes away some of that freedom um and and forces you to to build or 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 you know do things with your company in in a certain way and again every entrepreneur who regardless of who they are they have their own set of personal values. Some people's values, you know, the, the Koch brothers, um, uh, fall perfectly in line with that. Profit above all else, you know, growth above all else, greed is good, um, you know, to, to hell with the fish and the wildlife or whatever. Um, and there are others like, I, I, you know, the, the, the founder of Patagonia, Yvonne Chouinard, whose entire company and success is measured not on its profits, even though it's a very profitable, very successfully run clothing company, which outfits 90% of the fathers I know. Um, um, but it stands for something else. It stands for its environmental record. The fact that it's a leader on, you know, sourcing its materials and the way it treats its employees. These things are meaningful to the entrepreneur, so meaningful that they're willing to sacrifice profits in some instances to do it. And, you know, there's a chapter in the book about entrepreneurs pursuing their values. And I focused very much not on companies like Patagonia or sort of younger startups that are socially conscious and very much their branding, but on mid-sized manufacturing companies in the suburbs of Philadelphia run by white males in their, you know, middle age. I mean, your average American sort of businessman, your swing vote or whatever you want to call them, right? People who you wouldn't necessarily think of as that values driven entrepreneur. And these people actually, what they did was sold their companies to their employees through an employee ownership plan. And every one of them I talked to, you know, they talked about why they did it. They said, I, I said, what sacrifice did you make for this? Right. And they said, well, Private equity firms were calling me three times a week and they were offering me, you know, a four X multiple in the value of this business. But when you sell to a ESOP, you are legally bound to sell at fair market value. So I left, you know, 5 million, 10 million, 20 million, $30 million on the table, but I got enough. And, and I asked them, well, why did you do it? And they talked about, the relationship they had with their employees. They talked about the feeling they had toward their community and what those people had done to help them build their wealth and how they wanted to get back. Every single one of these men, and these are guys like, you know, one guy was a hardcore Trump supporting evangelical Christian. The other one was very much sort of left-wing socialist. And, and a lot were sort of that just quiet guy in the middle who puts his, puts his, his you know, hands down and, and, and works away. They all teared up. I mean, grown men tearing up in front of me as I was talking to them, speaking about why this mattered to them. And this was 
the sort of most meaningful thing they did in their life. Mm -hmm. And so there, there was like, you know, they had the option to take those profits and go and run with them. But they knew that being an entrepreneur and their opportunity and their responsibility is that stood for something that was far greater. Yeah, they're just driven by something else. So, so it's being, you think being an entrepreneur is, is for, um, for everyone or, or, or anyone? I mean, I think anyone and everyone has the ability to do it, right? When you look at who the entrepreneurs are, you know, there's this, the archetype of, well, they're a lone genius or they're brilliant or they're misfits or whatever. It's like, I know quiet people who are super unassuming and are entrepreneurs. I know outgoing gregarious people. I know financial geniuses. I know people who were in letters and ended up, or arts and ended up starting businesses that became successful. Um, you know, people from every single background can do it. All you need to do is start something and work for yourself and you're an entrepreneur. I do think there's a reason why only one in 10 Americans or similar numbers here in Canada do it. Um, and that is that risk, right? That same thing that we talked about at the beginning, which is, yeah, okay, that seems interesting, but you know, mm, I need a place to go each day. I need the certainty of a paycheck. I think you're going to see in the next months and years as the economic effects of what we're going through continue to reverberate um, a growing number of entrepreneurs. Uh, we know that you know, when, when times are bad and through recessions and depressions and, um, you know, bad economic times in other countries as well, that the number of people who have to work for themselves, who have to go out and start a business because they have no other option, there is no job for them, grows. And so we'll see more people who maybe never intended to become entrepreneurs become them. But that doesn't make them less important as entrepreneurs. It doesn't make the entrepreneurial experience less real for them. And it also doesn't mean that those humble businesses can't grow into successes. You know, you think of Levi Strauss, an itinerant peddler, Jewish immigrant to America who sold, you know, dry goods on a mule out West. And now, you know, we're all wearing his jeans or we would be if we didn't wear sweatpants for the past six weeks. So, you know, one of your chapters is devoted to um, uh, multi-generational entrepreneurship. Uh, and the notion uh, that that some sort of uh, entrepreneurial legacy exists. Um, and you yourself are the, are the child of entrepreneurial parents, and, and I, I guess your your wife is too, right? So, yes. so is um is there is there such a thing as kind of an entrepreneurial gene? I, I think what it is is you know a set of learned behaviors. I, I'm not going to get all nature nurture here, but I think that if you grow up in a household and you're surrounded by people who go to work each day for themselves, you see that as something that's very possible. And, um, and I, I think the thing that I got from, you know, my parents and especially my father, who's always worked for himself, but like me, you know, didn't have a company, has had sort of a, an assistant, but never employees, um, but has been very successful as a lawyer and then sort of as an investor and just general entrepreneur, that's what he calls himself, um, is that, you know, if you want to do something, you can just go out and do it. You don't have to wait for someone. You don't have to ask permission. So when I started out as a journalist and I was applying to newspapers and radio stations and magazines in Canada with, you know, my Bachelor of Arts and a couple of clippings from the student newspaper and people were like, no, God, get out of here. Um, he's like, well, why don't you just do it? Start writing for people. You can go freelance, go do it. You want to be a foreign correspondent, go move somewhere. And, and you know, you can make enough money to sustain yourself. You can do it. And that's what I did. And I think it's always that sort of that value that's there. And now that my wife um, started her own business a couple of years ago as a career coach, you know, she she really credits her mother, um, whose house I'm currently living in, uh, to to show her the way in that. And my my mother in law Fran, who was the child of Holocaust survivors that came and owned a stationery store and dealt scrap metal and feathers and whatever the hell they could do, right? They never made a ton of money, but they had a good life and a better life than they would have had, you know, had they never left Poland or or or, or immigrated. Um, and Fran, even though she got was one of the first female MBAs in Canada, that thing is even dustier than yours. She sold schmuttas and chachkas from card tables at hospitals and flea markets until a couple of years ago. Um, and she did it because she loved that, the same feeling of cash, that the, the flow of the deal. She didn't make that much money. It's, it was her husband 
you know, whose business, that multi-generational family business he went into, you know, that, that really sort of provided, but she was a natural born entrepreneur. And my mother, my wife took that same lesson from it, that idea of like, I can do this, you know, if, if she could do it. And I was literally the child that was in a basket under that card table, I can go and do it as well. Sure. And so I think you, you see that, I mean, you mentioned before when we were talking prior to the chat, um, that you, part of the reason you felt like, okay, you could do this when you bought the bookstore was that you came from a family of entrepreneurs. Yeah, that's true. I was actually a black sheep in the family when I decided to go into journalism because <clears throat> nobody in my extended family had been, been a journalist. Um, my father was not alive by the time I, I uh, decided to, um, uh, go into the book business. Um, he, he, he would have been a, astonished you know i think that uh that i i ended up as a, as a uh, local business person um but i i felt in part that you know it was it was it was in, in my blood uh, that and you know as you can probably identify with if, you, if you're a journalist you get thrown into enough situations that you may know very little about and you have to learn very quickly so i thought yeah. well you know i mean how hard can retail be it turned out to be <laughs> A, a lot harder, a lot harder than it looks, and I gained a lot of uh, respect and admiration for all those who've uh, who, who've made made uh, careers of it. Uh, let me say to the audience, you know, we're um, we're getting near the time where we normally uh, turn to you for questions, so please just jump in. And um, again, there's a button at the bottom uh, that says "Ask a Question," so just click on that and, and type in type in your question. Um, but let me uh, uh, let me ask ask you, David, uh, one or two more myself. Um, you know, the, uh, although this idea of entrepreneurship is 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 widely revered, um, you mentioned that there really aren't um, as many people uh, going into uh, business themselves uh, these days. And um, uh, you mentioned, well, some of that has to do with the risk. What what are there other factors that that explain? you know, why we don't see more entrepreneurs? Yeah, the, the decline in American entrepreneurship is um, a curious phenomenon because it, for a country that sort of prides itself and, and really ties into its national identity and its sort of historical myth, the land of the entrepreneur, the, the bootstrap pullers, um, entrepreneurship in the U.S. has been declining since I was born, you know, since Reagan came into office. Um, and even over the past decade, the the rate of business startups, the growth of those startups, the number of people they're employed has all been declining. Um, once you look beyond sort of the the relatively small number of Silicon Valley style startups around the country and, and venture capital funded companies, which are fairly a, a fairly small number, like relative to the number of overall businesses that are started in a year. Um, what you see is that it's increasingly difficult to start a business. It's increasingly hard to get funding. There's far fewer community banks and lenders that will lend to a small business. You know, most banks only want to lend, make loans of a million dollars and up because it's that's just what you know makes sense for them to do underwriting. Um, and so most people are sort of cut out of that. It's become something that's less attainable, even while it's more desirable and more revered. Um, and then there obviously there's the concentration. If you look in any business there are fewer companies that are much larger at the top and a lot of others struggling below them that are trying to find a foothold. And that's everything from airlines and travel to, you know, energy, to retail, to books, to publishing. Um, uh, yes, it's a golden age. It's easier to start a company. There's all sorts of software and workspaces and platforms and crowdfunding and so on. But, you know, you're not going to go out and start a, an internet search firm. You're you're not going to go out and start um, an online retail behemoth to compete with Amazon. It's you're going up against giants, and that makes it less competitive and less entrepreneurial. Um, you know, the U.S. begins to resemble places like Japan and South Korea, where you have these massive conglomerates that are incredible engines of economic creation and innovation, you know, your Samsungs and your Sonys and your Mitsubishis and your Yamahas. 
Um, they make everything from construction equipment to pianos, but uh, you know, it's less dynamic. There's less of that vibrancy and that hope that, Hey, I could start something. I could build something. I, I have an idea and I can go out and pursue it. And I think that's a really dangerous thing, especially in this age of horrendous populism and inequality uh, and the dangers that lie within that. Um, if people don't feel as though they can be entrepreneurs, you're really losing the core of, you know, the American dream or the bright spot of capitalism um, uh, or just sort of a, a center of a free society. Yeah, well, more power to those who, who, who brave the chat, who brave the challenge. Uh, we have several questions uh, here, so let's, uh, let's get to them. Um, the first is, do you see a lot of baby boomers becoming entrepreneurs? That's a really interesting question. Um, you know, the myth, uh, which again is sort of perpetuated by Silicon Valley is, well, entrepreneurs are young, millennials are the most entrepreneurial generation of all time. And, you know, you're brightest when you're younger. I think Zuckerberg says anyone who has, like anyone who has ideas over 30 is, is it sort of goes bad. Like their, their entrepreneurship dies up to that. The reality is quite the opposite. The average age, a study found, I think two years ago, of a successful technology company founder is 45 years old, right? So that includes a lot of people on the on the north side of, of 45. Um, uh, and as baby boomers have, um, uh, you know, found different parts of their career, perhaps left jobs, um, perhaps retired or gone to semi-retirement, many of them are are finding opportunities to pursue. I mean, I, I think about, you know, my my father's good friend, Jeffrey, his father was a very successful entrepreneur in Canada, incredibly successful, incredibly wealthy, built all sorts of businesses, was a major power player. And I think he, he passed away this year um, a couple of months ago uh, at maybe 100. But I think a few years ago when he was 90, he founded a cracker company because he wanted a specific type of cracker and a lobster roll restaurant. Um, this was someone that just had a passion for his ideas and putting them into, into the world through business. And nothing was ever going to stop him except death. Um, and so I think that you, you see it sometimes out of necessity, you know, if you have a pension, it can often be a meager thing or you're living off social security or some other fixed income and entrepreneurship is not only a means to supplement that, but it's invigorating, right? That intoxicating sense of possibility of, of your wheels spinning is what drives a lot of entrepreneurs and, you know, the last chapter of the book is actually about an entrepreneur who's 75 years old. His name is John Henry Clippinger. He's a, an inventor and a, a, an academic, a computer scientist at um, MIT, old positions there as well as Harvard. And he's had a number of different startups over the years, never been, you know, a wild, successful guy, but very intelligent, very thoughtful. And I asked him why he was doing it. He's working on a blockchain carbon trading startup. So extremely complicated, extremely risky. Um, and he said, you know, my life is about ideas. Like this, the day I stop having ideas and being able to act on them is the day I stop. I, I live for ideas. And, and he just felt compelled to pursue whatever idea he had to its logical conclusion and to hell with the risk. And so, yeah, you see a lot of them, um, as they're a significant proportion of the population, you should. What's interesting is that the millennials, the generation that were predicted to be the most entrepreneurial, have turned out to be the opposite, the least entrepreneurial. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah. So is there anything that surprised uh, you um, as you did your research? Mm. Um, I mean, aside from a few statistical things like the millennial um, fact that I cited there, the most surprising thing to me was the fact that I, early on in the book, I was interviewing mostly academics. I was just kind of getting the baseline of stuff and, and trying to figure out where I was going with it. And I would say, Hi, you know, I'm writing a book about entrepreneurs. And they said, well, what do you mean by an entrepreneur? And I was like, well, what do I mean? What do I mean? An entrepreneur, an entrepreneur, you know, an entrepreneur. They're like, well, and they would say some very specific definition. And so I started 
beginning every interview with the book was how do you define an entrepreneur? And what I found really fascinating and surprising was that everyone had a completely different definition. Some was, well, anyone who works for themselves. Some was, well, someone who starts a business. Well, someone who starts a business, but they take on tremendous risk. Well, they have to take on debt. Well, they have to grow at a certain rate. Well, they need to take on venture capital. Well, really anyone who comes up with innovative ideas is an entrepreneur, even if they're working at a job. And on and on and on and on. And, and, and it really reflected who someone was. And I think the thing I realized about it, and the reason I arrived at a very broad example, almost going back to Richard Cantillon's um, original definition of it, is that it is so reflective of that individual's experience. So that's why I could say I'm an entrepreneur because to me, this is what it means. Whereas to someone who starts a company, you're like, what is this schmuck who like sits in his sweatpants and writes books and goes paddleboarding in his free time? He's not an entrepreneur, he's just a writer. He's a self-employed, he's a freelancer. You can't tell me that that, that doesn't mean it. So that really, not only was surprising, but it sort of drove, that question really drove the essence of, of what it, and you do in reading the book, you know, you make a very strong case uh, that the term should embrace qu quite a few different lifestyles and quite a few different types of businesses and, 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 and the people who run them. Because here's the problem. When you make it too defined, when you say, well, you have to be, you have to be innovative. Okay. Who is innovative? Well, you know, innovative sort of things that, that change industry. Okay. So someone comes along and they have, a company that claims to make a new scooter and that's going to change the world. They're able to be called an entrepreneur because that falls into the innovative box. But if you at your bookstore all of a sudden start offering poetry events as you did a couple of years ago, where you paired with the poetry bar, I completely forgot what it was. You'll explain it to people. Um, uh, you know, and that suddenly changed the view of poetry in DC and changed a neighborhood and whatever that's innovative. You know, if, if Tracy Abalski is one of the characters in my book, the entrepreneurs I talk about has a bakery in New York City, and she invents a ham and cheese croissant topped with everything bagel spice. That's innovative. It's not going to put me on the moon, but taste-wise, it will. Um, so when you when you narrow it down so much, when you add so many caveats to it, you exclude so many entrepreneurs. But it's also so subjective. Oh well successful entrepreneurs are the only ones that really count. Okay, well, how do you define that, right? Or if you're gonna make it a numerical amount, all right, what, you know, is it a million dollars in revenue and profit? Like, where does it, where does it sort of fit? The thing that links all of them together is the experience of being an entrepreneur. So you and me and Elon Musk, we bear the risk and we have the freedom. And we go through that journey together, regardless of what we're doing and what it looks like. Yeah. And and that's the beautiful thing about it. Yeah. You hear that, Elon? <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, if there were a true national health, uh, there were a true national health service, would there be more entrepreneurs? Um, there's been a lot of studies of this, uh, and from what I've seen, the answer is not conclusive. I live in Canada, where there is a true national health service. Um, and you know we have a slightly higher rate of entrepreneurship but not tremendously and there are other companies uh countries like japan and germany and france which um some of which have lower rates of entrepreneurship than the united states so there's not a direct correlation in that sense that said um benefits and healthcare is something that no one i know here in canada ever thinks of when they're going into entrepreneurship. It's not a calculation they make. It's not a worry on their mind. Um, you know, dental care, uh, eyeglass care. Okay, that's, that's, that, that isn't part of it. You know, massages, whatever. But, um, but it's certainly not a factor. And, and I think, you know, that is, that is something that really, when I speak to friends of mine who are entrepreneurs, who are self-employed, um, who are running companies and have to actually pay for the stuff in the United States, it is a tremendous issue and something that occupies a vast amount of their time. And I know, and I know people who have left their businesses and, and not pursued them or, or quit after a while because of that, or only were able to do it because uh, a spouse or a partner had that health care that covered them. Uh this next questioner says, I see many examples of entrepreneurs creating new opportunities during the COVID-19 crisis. 
that's exciting to see. But it also seems uh, like we will lose many small entrepreneurial businesses that just uh, won't be able to make it in the near term. Do you fear for the annihilation of many entrepreneurial businesses uh, in coming months? Absolutely. And I think this is something that, you know, we see every day. I mean, we drive around our neighborhoods. We see photos of them if we're not driving around or leaving our houses. Um, and the businesses we love are boarded up in many cases. They're closed. Sure, you can offer some delivery. You can do some services. You can try to do your classes online. You know, for many, it's just a pittance. And the government supports whatever country you're in, you know, you're talking about a lifeline. You're not talking about, you know, keeping things as they were. Um, and you're going to see millions of businesses probably closing in the next couple of years because of what's happening now. Um, that happens and it's terrible. You're going to see others starting up as well. But, you know, beyond the economic statistics, you have to remember that behind each one of those is an individual with hopes and dreams that were poured into their business. And it's not the same as losing a job. You know, th there was one study that came out of Finland and they took entrepreneurs into an MRI machine and they sort of studied their brain activity as they were talking about their family, their friends, um, and their business. And they found that the same areas of their brain lit up in terms of pleasure centers or emotional identification with their business and their family like people saw it as a member of, of their family and of course your business isn't your family your family should always come first they're far more important they're human a business cannot love you back but that doesn't make the emotional connection any less real or visceral and so when you think about these people you're like oh well you know they're losing money but they'll be able to get a job they have skills or whatever it's not about the job it's that 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 business is so intricately tied into their identity. I mean, I'd love for you to talk about this a little bit, Brad, because you're not just a bookseller. You're very involved with the American um, Booksellers Association, which is the Association of Independent Bookstores that's been growing and very strong across the country. And now businesses like yours or smaller ones that are far less funded in smaller markets are struggling. What are you hearing from them uh, in terms of both what they're going through and, and, the, and the difficulty of that? And also, as, as the questioner asked, you know, some of the innovative ideas that people are coming up with, some of the things that you're seeing that show that, you know, entrepreneurial spirit in this difficult time. Well, there's a range of emotions, you know, that uh, come out in conversations that booksellers are having now, you know, often in Zoom settings, um, you know, range of emotions from, you know, determination and grit will get through this, you know, like we have through all the, uh, these previous uh, crises when people were ready to uh, uh, prematurely, as it turns out, to write off independent bookstores. Um, and then the other end of the spectrum, you know, despair and sense of hopelessness, a feeling that, you know, our, the business has changed right now. It's not being a bookseller is not what it was like before. We've become, to the extent that, that any of our business or, or stores are really still operating, basically just kind of, uh, warehouses to fulfill online orders which we're very grateful for so keep them coming but that's click. not click right click add stuff to your purchase tote bags or books you know but we don't see customers anymore we don't engage and that was really so much the core of our business and so there's a sense uh that your booksellers expressing that you know what, what business are we in now I mean, this is not what we signed up for you know so you know i um but it's hard you know not to believe that we will all get through this and independent bookstores in particular um, will uh, be, be back, you know. Uh, again, it may take uh, months and months, um, like it will our, our, our whole economy and the, and the rest, rest of the world. Uh, there may be some that will go out of business, you know, no doubt that that, that will happen. Um, but, um, you know, we we uh, served an, an important need before, and that need exists now more, more than ever. Um, you know, when you were talking about not confusing your your uh, your business with your family, Melissa and I, we have three three kids, but we have been known to refer to politics and prose as our fourth child. Um, 
So we are our little a troubled child. Yeah, a little, a little guilty of that. Um, so, so this is more of a comment. The uh, the writer says than a question. Uh, my father was an entrepreneur, and four of my siblings have started their own businesses. My father didn't want to work for anyone else, and my siblings like being in charge. I wonder where they got that from. Yeah, it's uh, you know again that like you're not guaranteed anything but that independence. So if for most entrepreneurs that is that's that breaking thing, right? So it's like I have this idea, and either there's nowhere else for me to go and sort of work on it, or it's like I can't listen to these bums doing it. There's this great book that I read as part of the research um, called, I'm now completely forgetting it. Is it The Enterprising Man? I think so. Um, ask me about that later. Uh, and it was this, it was the sort of first big study of American entrepreneurs um, in the 1950s out of University of Michigan, I think, uh, or Michigan State. And it talked to a bunch of different entrepreneurs who owned different businesses in the sort of Detroit Flint area, Dearborn area, and most of them were sort of auto shops or auto parts companies, stuff related to, to cars. And I remember, you know, there was this one thing, it was like motivation. It's like most entrepreneurs are, you know, driven by a desire to, to, you know, be their own boss and do things independently. And there was this quote from this one guy is like, I didn't like working for these bums and these bums were telling this and I told him to hell with you bums, I'm going to go start my own thing. <laughs> and it just so stuck with me because how many people do you know that have gone and done that thing? To hell with you bums. Even if you say it in your head, you're like, well, they said, I'm going to submit my resignation. It's like, you bums, I'm going to show you bums. <laughs> yeah, I'll show you, yeah. Um, so uh, uh, this next question begins, um, I've always thought that professional golfers are entrepreneurs. Every week they have to make the cut to make money. What's your opinion? Um. <laughs> as someone who doesn't golf, but who is living next to a golf course for the past six weeks and walking on it, I can appreciate that. I mean, I, I look. I mean, are athletes entrepreneurs? You know, I, I I think some are right. Some like if you are a team athlete, you're not. You are an employee. You are literally traded to other teams. You you don't have that right. But if you're Jack Nicholas or Arnold Palmer or feed me names, people, Tiger Woods. <laughs> um, you do, you know, you are, you are an entrepreneur, both in terms of you bear the risk of going out onto that golf course every day and hitting the drive in the way that you will, and that will affect your career and whatever. Um, but also in the business sense, right? You, you, there's, there's all sorts of, you know, fantastic athletes who weren't necessarily the greatest on the field, that um, were incredibly that that took that same sense of competitive spirit and ideas and became, you know, these entrepreneurs: Shaquille O'Neal, Bo Jackson, Arnold Palmer, the guy who invented one of the greatest, most delicious um, beverages of all time. Uh, I don't know if he made money off it. Oh, he does. Yeah, he has a little packet. Um, there you go. There's my golf tie-in. So I, I think again, you know, it's 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 asking those people. But yeah, a golf like you know. A golfer is not employed by Titleist. They have a contract with them. Whew, Titleist, really had to scratch the back of my head for that. <laughs> Good one. Um, all right, we've got one more, one last question here. This is about a golf question. This is about, about coaching programs for successful entrepreneurs. This question wants to know if, uh, if you specifically know Dan Sullivan, a st strategic coach. Um, um, but apart from that, I mean, what, what do you think of, of coaching programs for, for entrepreneurs? I've heard Dan Sullivan's name. Um, I can't remember where. Maybe I was on his podcast. I can't remember, though. Um, I, I think there is a lot of great education out there for entrepreneurs, a lot of great support for entrepreneurs. My wife is a career coach, and I've been pushing her to create a coaching program for entrepreneurs, especially now sort of dealing with resilience. I'm like, well, can cross market it. We'll sell the book. We'll, we'll do We'll do great. Being very entrepreneurial. Um, uh, I, you know, there's also a lot of entrepreneurs that are trying to sell you something that you may not necessarily need. And the reality is every entrepreneur's journey is different. Every entrepreneur's path to success is different because every entrepreneur's definition of success and circumstances are different. 
And I think you have to be wary of anything that's very prescriptive about how to be an entrepreneur and how to succeed. And that's why people, someone asked me the other day, they said, oh, well, does your book have any tips about how to succeed and what makes the difference between successful entrepreneurs and not? No, it's who am I to tell you that, right? Um, there are books out there that do it. And I think most entrepreneurs don't know, right? They they start something and they happen into it. And, you know, there's, there's so much luck and circumstance there. Um, I think one of the more important things for entrepreneurs beyond uh, coaching is great. Um, and there's great organizations. And I think depending on the industry you're in, there's excellent coaches and, and programs. And, and, and the value of that is good because what entrepreneurs need is more than anything sort of support and a voice um, that they can have someone to speak with and someone understands them because fundamentally, whether you are heading up a company with tons of people and working with different partners and have hundreds of employees and see people all the day, or whether you're someone like me who is working alone, there is a general sense of solitude and loneliness to being an entrepreneur. So much of it is in your head. So much of it is wrestling with your own ideas and feeling that you're alone, even if you do work with other people. And so I think the value of a coach for entrepreneur is almost more so than someone who's working in, in you know, an employed environment um, because sometimes you need to talk with someone who can get that out of your head and teach you how to deal with that. And I think that's the most valuable thing that some of these coaches can do. So if, if you know, Dan Sullivan is, is one of those people, then, then great. I don't know. I can't speak to anyone specifically, except my wife, who I will push to start this course sometime the next year. So two more questions have squeezed in here under the wire. Um, one is, does culture uh, play a role in the prevalence of entrepreneurs? Um, how does Canada, for instance, compare to the, the U.S. And the, and the U.S. Com compare to the rest of the world? Um, I mean, I think the U.S. tends to see itself as a, a more entrepreneurial place um, and it values it highly. Uh, so I think there is there is that element of culture, right? Japan has a very low rate of entrepreneurship. And so much of that is based upon a culture of, you know, teamwork and um, hierarchy and respect for seniority. And, um, and the United States is the opposite of that, right? It's very much the sort of frontier mentality still, still works with that. Whether that affects the pure rate of entrepreneurship, it depends. I think within other cultures, you know, again, it comes down to that family thing, right? There are immigrant groups that have much higher rates of entrepreneurship than the rest, um, you know, Jews, which I come from, um, uh, Gujarati Indians, or, um, you know, certain Latin American populations. And a lot of that's just due to circumstances, right? If a group comes and they're immigrants, uh, they are going to be cut out of the workplace for a period of time. And so entrepreneurship becomes their their means to make a living, but that then that gets passed down as a value, uh, as something that's possible. And so you might still see that prevalence two, three generations after that first generation immigrated. Um, uh, so I think it does, but you know, there are entrepreneurs all over the world. I mean, I was reading an article in The Economist today about entrepreneurs in North Korea uh, and how these sort of black market entrepreneurs make up like two thirds of the North Korean economy um, in a place where being an entrepreneur can get you shot. So uh, it is this inherently human thing. Everyone wants their ideas to be fulfilled. Everyone wants to have the economic freedom to go out and make a living in the way that they want to do. Um, and wherever we've tried to restrain that, it, it can't be held back. And so you do see it everywhere, which is why every immigrant group that comes, you know, gets into it as, as this sort of, well, okay, can't get a job. So here we go. What can we do? What can you make? What can you cook? How can we make some money? Like, let's do it. And so I think it, you, you see its prevalence in certain cultures and and it, there's an aspect of it, but it's it's fairly universal. Okay, final question. Um, you've referenced mostly male entrepreneurs or athletes. Mm. Uh, can you say more about women going into their uh, own uh, own business? And, 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 and yeah. I mean, to be fair, I mean, the book profiles a number, a number of women. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, so first of all, I'm sorry about that in the reference. My golf references are entirely male and I will work on my LPGA um, references for the next question I have. Uh, in the book, I made a very concerted effort to focus um, uh, 
on a wide diversity of entrepreneurs, including, you know, female entrepreneurs. And so at least half of the entrepreneurs I talk to in the book are female as well as um, uh, representative of, of various different minorities. Um, the fastest growing group of entrepreneurs in the United States are women and especially minority women. And you wouldn't know this by looking at um, venture capital or that sort of world. Actually, uh, in 2018, which is the last year there were stats for, the um, number of or the amount of venture capital deals and money that went to women was like 2.8%, which is the highest it's ever been. So you've come a long way, baby. Um, and, and just disgusting and despicable when you think about this being more than 50% of the population. Women are entrepreneurs in every single field. Um, and often it's sort of dismissed as, oh, well, they're lifestyle entrepreneurs, someone who's just a, a mompreneur is a term. Um, but, you know, the female entrepreneurs that I met in this book who did everything from owning wineries to, um, to starting and running restaurants and food businesses, Jessica Dupart, the woman in New Orleans he talked to, runs, you know, a multi million dollar hair product business that she built from the ground up. They are um, just as savvy, just as intelligent, just as innovative as male entrepreneurs. But in another sense, they're also more committed to community. They're more likely to grow slower and more thoughtfully. And there's studies that show this. Uh, and despite all the barriers they face, they continue pushing ahead into being entrepreneurs. Uh, one of the things I love about you know booksellers is there are so many fantastic bookstores that are owned and begun and operated by, by women and by people of color. Um, and it makes them better business people. They, that, that empathy, that sense of, you know, imagine running a bookstore that has a kid's section and you, you know, you don't like kids. You're like a single male. Um, I mean, you can do it, right? If someone does that, that's awesome. But uh, there are all these aspects of, of, of women as entrepreneurs that, that is really strong. And I think of people like my, my mother-in-law friend or my own mother um, who had, uh, was mostly, you know, a stayed at home, take care of us. But twice a year, she had a clothing sale in our basement. She got, you know, people in Montreal to, 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 she would go to Montreal. She would buy clothes wholesale from distributors. Uh, and she would do this big sample sale and, you know, cash business in the basement with her best friend, Paula every year. And it was this wonderful thing. Or my friend, Dan Steinberg's mom, who, um, had a, a million little businesses as well. But I also have friends who are women and entrepreneurs and own, you know, huge companies that they began and are more brilliant than the men who are in their fields and yet face, you know, dismissive ideas from investors um, who just don't believe that a woman can, can do it as well. So that is a mythology that needs to be pricked. The, the women are a growing entrepreneurial force. They've always been, um, they always will be, and and they need the respect they deserve, even in golf, uh, especially in golf, I guess. Well, and with that, uh, we're, we're out of time. Uh, David, thanks thanks so much for, for spending uh, this evening with us and for a, a very enlightening discussion about entrepreneurship. I hope the book does well enough that you will continue not to need a regular paycheck I'm unemployable at this point, so <laughs> I don't have a choice. Again, the, again, the title of, of David's book is "The Soul of, a, of an Entrepreneur," and um, have we have we mentioned that you can get a copy or several uh, by clicking on the green button at the at the bottom of your screen? Uh, and thanks again to uh, to everyone watching for for tuning in. Your your support is truly what enables us to to bring you programming like this. Uh, click the the follow button at the at the top uh, of the screen to get notifications of other uh, PNP live events and check our website regularly for updated event listings. Uh, from all of us at Politics and Prose, stay well uh, and well read.